It's the time of year when everyone is traveling or running around, getting thoughtful gifts for the people you care about. Think about giving yourself the gift of an Audible membership. Now is the best time to do it with a special offer of 53% off of your first three months. Access an unbeatable selection of audiobooks, including bestsellers, motivation, mysteries, thrillers, memoirs, and more. You can choose three titles every month, one audiobook and two exclusive Audible originals that you can't hear anywhere else. Listen on any device, anytime, anywhere with the Audible app. It's great while commuting, at the gym, or during your holiday travels. With Audible, you'll also enjoy easy audiobook exchanges and your own audiobook library that you'll keep forever, even if you cancel. I strongly recommend Jaws by Peter Benchley. If you thought the movie was good and scary, then you need to listen to the audiobook. Trust me. Right now, for a limited time, you can get three months of Audible for just $6.95 a month. That's more than half off the regular price. Give yourself the gift of listening. Go to audible.com forward slash being scared or just text being scared to 500 500. Again, that's audible.com forward slash being scared or just text being scared to 500 500. Before I get started, I want to inform everyone that I will be changing the names of the people involved for privacy reasons, and I can say that this is 100% true. Let me tell you a little background about my house setup. This will come in handy further in the story. I live in a small trailer with my parents and five siblings. I am the oldest, being 16, and I'm a female. The trailer I live in, if you walk in from the front door, you're straight in the living room, then going left through the large French doors, you're in the kitchen. Furthermore, off the small kitchen, a tiny hallway is located there, which has two doors. The door at the end of the hallway was my brother's room, and the room on the left was mine and my sister's. And in the front of the house, past the living room, is another hallway that leads to a small bedroom. That's my parents' room. This happened in the summer about two years ago. I have always been around the paranormal, and my parents have always believed that I'm the cause of it. When I was born, a lot of unexplainable things started happening, and it has followed me everywhere. I came home from going out with some friends, and my sister, for this story I will call her Anna, was only six at the time, and was deep asleep. We had a bunk bed. I was on the bottom bunk, as I had to wake up in the morning for school. I opened my door around 11 p.m. after taking a shower, checked on Anna who was sleeping with her eyes open. I was used to it. And I got onto my bed and grabbed my phone to watch some videos. I must have been on the phone for some time, as when I went to lay down for bed, as I had school tomorrow, the time read 2 a.m. Now for everyone to know, I have really bad tinnitus, so I needed white noise before going to sleep. Tonight I decided on some music. After 10 minutes of searching, I found some tunes that I liked. I then shut my eyes, but then started hearing small footsteps running down towards my room. It sounded like it came from the living room. I don't know if it is normal, but I can tell who is coming near by the sound of footsteps. But these were weird. They were small so I knew they were children's, but very light and definitely running. I keep my eyes closed, trying to think of who could potentially be approaching my room, but I couldn't tell like I normally could. I then heard my door open. I heard a child giggle, and I froze, my eyes still shut, and I knew that this was no one in my family. After a few seconds, I slowly opened my eyes, to find a small girl, maybe around the age of six, looking like she was closing an invisible door. 
She put her hands on the door, the real one, and laughed. I froze again watching this girl, who had a very old dress on, which was a faded yellow with white lace on the bottom, and the style of the dress reminded me of the little house on the prairie. She then turned around and rested her back on the door, and slid down putting her butt on the floor, her knees up, and the dress roughed. She put her head onto her knees and giggled like she was hiding from someone, playing a game. I finally shifted my blankets making a small noise, which made the small girl look over at me, gasping, like she didn't know I was in the room. She had very long dark hair, I want to say brown hair. We locked eyes and then like mist in the sun, she vanished. I freaked, grabbed my phone and messaged my close friend so I could remember what happened and to calm myself down. My heartbeat pounded and I counted sheep trying to calm down, which must have worked as I woke up in the morning. I went to school and told my close friend, who was very concerned, as she read my message. After busting on me for smoking the devil's lettuce, marijuana, which I did not and she did actually believe me, I came home and told my mom, who looked at me eyes wide and told me I was lying and that I was trying to scare her. I spoke up and told her no, that this happened. I have a message sent to my friend to prove it. She then told me that around the same time, she heard two kids playing out in the living room. She got up very angry, thinking it was Anna and my younger brother playing, but she opened her door to find the living room empty. Confused, she went to check on my brother and sister to see if they were asleep, and they were. This is only a small amount of what has happened to me and my family in this house. I am writing this story in my apartment the day after this event occurred, and I cannot feel at ease no matter how hard I try. Some context. I am a 24-year-old female, 5'4", and 115 pounds. I recently moved into a crappy apartment in a large city in Texas with my boyfriend. We ended up in this place because we owed another apartment money at the time, and in order to get a nicer place, we needed to pay off that debt. So we signed a short six month lease and though we paid off the debt already, we have to finish the remaining months regardless as to not break another lease. This current place is cheap, very old, as we unfortunately discovered, not surrounded by the most trustworthy characters. The layout of this apartment has a front entrance gate and as you enter, it goes around in an upside down U shape all the way to the exit gate. The parking spots were all along the area in which you drive through the complex. Each apartment door has a semi-private entryway unless facing the street, so it is hard to see exactly which door the person enters if you're in the parking spaces. Mine is one of the semi-private entryways. There are also dumpsters around each corner of turns throughout the U-shape. Our apartment is at the back left corner of this U-shape. The first incident that occurred was rather unnerving to me, considering this layout of our apartment. It was 7 a.m., and I groggily opened our apartment door to head to work. I looked down, and my blue backpack that I kept in my car after moving was open and on the ground in front of me. I wasn't starting my next semester of classes until a month from then, so I had no reason to take it out or have much in it. The few contents were thrown outside of the backpack, and it was right on my doorstep. I looked at it, obviously weirded out, and proceeded up and around the corner to see my car in the distance, doors wide open. I was of course pissed that somebody broke into my vehicle, but I was extremely uneasy that they somehow knew whose car that must have belonged to considering the bag was right in front of my doorway. This bothered me for some time, but as it was the first week, I forgot about it. Now I am in the fourth month of my stay at these apartments, 
and I am beyond ready to leave and never come back. Yesterday morning was normal. I got up, got ready, and hopped in my car. As I was passing the dumpster a mere 30 feet away from where our cars are usually parked, I rolled down my passenger window and chucked some crumpled up trash through it into the dumpster. Something I do often to keep trash from piling up in my car. And then I drove on my way. My day was tiring due to having three finals and an appointment, so once I got home, I was relieved. As I connected to Wi-Fi, I saw my boyfriend had sent me a Snapchat at 1.30pm, as he was heading to work at the time. I opened the Snapchat to find a picture of four police cars blocking off the turn near the dumpster. Weird, I messaged to him. It must have been a homeless guy or someone breaking into stuff, he replied. Yeah, I guess. Maybe it'll be on the news later or something. I sat down thinking nothing of it, which considering my normally overactive imagination was unlike me. I went onto YouTube and was getting ready to chill for the remainder of the evening when my phone buzzed again. I opened it to see a text from my boyfriend. A link was attached, showing a helicopter view picture of the corner of our apartments where the dumpster was sitting. The title read, Body Found in Apartment Complex Dumpster on Northwest Side. I stared for a moment and then felt my face go numb and the slight feeling of nausea creep into my gut. I immediately called my boyfriend and he seemed surprisingly unconcerned about the entire thing. I, on the other hand, could only think of the decaying corpse of a person who I tossed trash onto unsuspectingly that morning. Apparently the body found was a woman, 35 to 40 years old, with blunt trauma to the head. They don't know if she was killed in the complex or just dumped there. The complex has its security gate broken and open half the time anyway, so who knows. All I know for sure is that I need to talk to the office about ending my lease right away, because I no longer feel safe in this place. I'd like to start this off by saying that I'm a 19-year-old girl about 5'5", weighing 110 pounds. To many people I'm considered tiny and approachable. To give a little backstory, I have worked at a pharmacy for the last year and a half, mainly doing grunt work, garbage runs, filing, masking boxes and the like, along with my normal prescription filing duties. My office is located in a pretty sketchy part of downtown, in a major city. It is on the third floor of a four-story building that faces a busy road in the front, and an older, run-down residential area to the back, where the garbage bins are fenced in next to the underground parking entrance. Directly across the alley that the bins are in is a worn-down yellow house that rarely sees the light through the overgrown trees and vegetation in the yard behind the gate. I had never seen anyone in or around that house during my daily garbage runs, though I did notice two very large cane Corso dogs that were caged on the rickety deck. I kept getting that feeling of being watched during one of my more recent trips to the bins, and I hesitantly glanced towards the creepy yellow house to find nothing out of the ordinary. Now, I'm an avid horror fan used to being a little bit spooked by cliches, like creepy houses, and spend my days being paranoid over everyday circumstances, constantly looking behind my shoulder and being suspicious of everyone that moves around me. So I chalked it up to me being paranoid. The feeling never subsided, so as I rushed to finish the job, I took one last peek behind me and saw a very tall, slender man with unkempt shaggy gray hair, wearing a tattered white tank top with holes and stains, peering out the bay window over the deck and straight at me. 
At this point, I had never known someone lived there, as I had never seen anyone, and my customer service instinct kicked in, and I gave him the best polite smile that I could form. He did not return it, and continued to burn his eyes into my being, and after what seemed like hours, he slowly retreated back out of sight, never breaking eye contact. This was just my first encounter with this man, but oh, do I wish it was my only one. The next few times were normal, with me glancing every now and then to see nothing but the pitch black inside of the house and a few birds fluttering around his yard. Until the day that is burned into my brain forever. It was a hot and sunny Tuesday, and I had worn a navy dress to keep me cool during the day. The time comes for me to do my garbage trip, and I grab my exacto knife that I used to break down cardboard and slipped it into my dress pocket. Pulling my small cart of cardboard and garbage around the fence and into the partially enclosed area of bins, I look across the alleyway and see the man standing on his deck. He walks over to the cages and lets the dogs out, and they sprint down the stairs of the deck and up to the chain-link fence surrounding the yard and begin barking furiously in my direction. After getting refocused on my job at hand, I periodically peered over my shoulder and out of the corner of my eye to keep tabs on this man, until the last time I did so, when I could no longer see him standing on his deck, but rather he was slinking along the sidewalk out of his fence and in the shadows of the trees from his yard. He paced back and forth, about thirty feet in each direction, before spinning back and going the other way. I began panicking and rushing, catapulting the cardboard into the bin. And that's when I heard the sound. Rocks, from the gravel alley being scuffed under heavy footsteps. I mustered up all the courage I could and turned my entire body to face the man, my hand in my pocket gripping the knife tightly, ready to defend myself. To my horror, the man was less than ten feet in front of me, head down staring at the ground with one hand behind his back and the other in his pocket. As he closed the gap between us, I heard a voice from behind me, to my left. I turned to investigate the voice, and it was a young man, a tall, gawky man, probably around twenty-three or twenty-four, that I had recognized from the cafe on the first floor, with a garbage bag in his hands. He asked me, is that your cart? I glanced towards the cart and dumbfounded, I responded with, Yes. He struck up a conversation with me and came close and rested his hand on my shoulder and looked me in the eyes and whispered, Come with me. He grabbed my cart and began walking towards the building. And this is when I turned back to look at the man who had scurried back across the alley to his fence scrambling to open the latch while shoving something into his pocket and cursing under his breath, shooting daggers at the cafe man. When we made it back into the parking lot adjacent to our building, he stopped and said, I was on my way to the bins when I noticed that man coming toward you. I hoped asking about your card and being near you would deter him from whatever he was thinking of doing. Now you be safe and bring a partner every time you go down here or you can come grab me if no one else can. We said our goodbyes and I thanked him profusely. I never went down alone again after telling my co-workers what had happened. To the young man in the cafe, at the time your small talk seemed meaningless and forced, but it very well could have been the reason that I am still alive. I'd like to start off by saying my parents live on a plantation in the middle of nowhere in Mississippi. I won't say specifically where due to privacy. Growing up it was me and my brother who is four years older than me and he's still my best friend to this day. My dad was a farmer so me and my brother both grew up with a love for outdoors and adventure. We have over 7,000 acres and a total of six barns. 
My grandparents owned this land before my father inherited it. I was six years old at the time of this encounter and my brother was ten. My mother had just passed and it was just us three left. We were out one day exploring the barn. My dad was out in the fields tilling to prepare for the crops we had coming in. We ended up down in the community, which was about two miles or so from our house, which consisted of seven houses that were out in the woods. By this time they were overgrown and underkept due to their lack of tenants who were in charge of the upkeep. To give you a bit of insight into how these looked, I will try my best to give a brief explanation. They were all wooden houses, one story of course, with a small porch and a large wooden door. They had two windows on each side of the front door and windows all along the sides, all broken. The grass was waist high and the tree limbs had broken into the windows and some had even grown into the side of one of the houses. My brother was carrying a machete to chop away some of the undergrowth so that we could get to them. We entered the front house that was a bit bigger than the rest, with tin on the roof and a brick chimney. The steps broke under our feet, and my brother had to help me climb up. The porch had almost completely rotted by this point. I'm not a tall girl, and my legs are especially short, making high cabinets and big steps difficult for me. Even now. My brother went first, opening the door with a heavy kick from the wood, being warped and disfigured. He shut the door the best he could behind us. We entered the house to see most of the floor was missing, revealing grass and even small trees growing through the floor. Rodents scattered every direction, making me yelp, but my brother just laughed. There was a mattress to the left, and the springs were the only thing remaining. All of a sudden, we heard a loud crack right outside the door, causing both of us to freeze where we were. My brother whispered that it was probably a deer and to be super quiet so that we had a chance to see him. We both slowly crept over to one of the windows to try to see outside and to see the deer. We both had a love for animals and enjoyed watching them. As we reached the window, we heard very hushed voices and I very distinctly remember the deep growl of one of the voices telling the other, Shut up. I don't know where they are. I don't know where they went, but I swear when we find them, I will kill all of them. I don't care. I'll kill them all before I go to jail. Then he erupted into manic laughter that echoed through the woods. I remember the look on my brother's face. I knew he was terrified. My brother was only ten at the time, but he was almost six feet, and almost nothing scared him. If he was scared, I definitely knew that I should be too. He whispered for me to crouch down so we couldn't be seen through the window. I crept down next to a rotten couch that reeked of decay. The smell alone made me gag. Tears were spilling out of my eyes, and I kept my hands over my mouth to keep my sobs quiet. I bit down so hard on my hand, I remember tasting blood. My brother was peering over the side of the window, his face white. I heard limbs breaking as the trespassers were making their way toward every house to find us. I remember thanking God that my brother had shut the door. My brother motioned me to come towards him, and I slowly crept to where he was, trying to make as little noise as possible. He told me that he was going to open the door, and that when he did, I needed to run all the way back to the house and try to find Dad. He kept nudging me towards the door, and he was getting frustrated when I wouldn't move. I heard one of the men tell the other one to check the big building, and my heart froze. The house we were in was significantly bigger than all the rest, and I knew that they were coming for us. We heard sticks snapping from every direction and in my child's mind, I knew we were going to die. Nothing is scarier than thinking you're going to die at such a young age. I was absolutely terrified. I was behind my brother against the wall, and he was holding my hand. 
I remember how sweaty his shaking hand was and how fast his heart was beating. He had the machete brandished like some sword in a sci-fi movie, and I almost chuckled at the sight, as scared as I was. The door to the house was kicked open, and there stood four men standing about six feet or so in height. They all looked like they hadn't bathed in years, and I could smell them from where they were standing. They smelled of rotten meat and body odor. Their teeth were yellowing, some missing, and they looked like they had been beat up, covered in bruises and blood. The blonde guy in the front was the first to speak. His voice still terrorizes me to this day. Well, look what we have here. A knight in shining armor. And a princess. He laughed. My brother spoke in the deepest voice he could manage. This is my dad's land. You better get out of here. He, he's got guns, and he'll shoot you. He knows where we are. The blonde guy chuckled, shaking his head, and took a step towards us. The next thing he said chilled me to my core. Your daddy can't save you. No one can. And he took another step towards us. He looked over at me and my blood went cold. He smiled, and I could see that he only had one front tooth, and only a few were left in his menacing smile. I love pretty blonde girls. I'd love to take you with me. My own pretty little girl. I've always wanted a little girl. I cried out and buried my face into my brother's back as I wept, screaming for my dad. Daddy can't save you now. He screamed and my brother lunged towards the guy and swung the machete as hard as he could, almost knocking himself over from its weight. All of the men started laughing maniacally. My brother stepped closer to the men, swinging the machete again, coming inches from the blonde guy's face. He leaned back to avoid the blow and started laughing louder. The sound was like something out of the most awful horror movie. I could hear the cracking in their voices. Their smiles made it even worse. All of the men were in the house with us now, and the lanky black-haired guy shut the door behind him. They kept inching closer to us, and my brother was telling me to stay behind him as he kept the machete pointed toward them. Then, the most heavenly sound. Out of nowhere, we heard a truck horn, and my heart jumped into my throat. The road leading to the community was maybe 200 yards from the house, with few trees between it. The guys went stock straight and bolted out the door. One of their legs fell through the floor, and he quickly yanked it out and bolted. We looked out to see my dad and cousins jumping out of his truck, with their guns in hand. They fired a few shots, missing the guys by inches. My dad ran into the house and scooped me up. My brother was crying, and my dad was too. He hugged me and my brother so tight that day. My dad never let us go near the community again, and only let us go into the barns if he was with us. He told me recently that he had thought we were dead already, and he will never be happier than the day he found us alive. As for the guys, after my dad and cousins arrived, they bolted deeper into the woods, and my cousins pursued them, but gave up after a mile or so. My cousin still swears that he shot one of them in the leg, but it was never confirmed. My dad told my brother that he was coming to the barn for a drink and to rest for a minute, and heard my screams, and they immediately followed them to us. My brother and I both received intense counseling for the next few months afterwards. I'm 22 years old, and I still wake up in a panic, reliving the worst day of my life with those awful men. I am so thankful for my brother for doing his best to keep me alive. I'm even more thankful for my dad and cousins, and that they had given the fields a rest, even if just for a moment. God only knows what would have happened to us if they had not shown up. It scares me to this day to think about it.
In high school, some friends and I really enjoyed exploring abandoned buildings in the small city I was in, and climbing occupied buildings. We generally went as a group of three to five. Two people didn't feel safe enough, and six felt like we made too much noise and would get caught. These two experiences happened when I decided to go with only one other person. The first experience was my junior year of high school, when a close friend and I decided to go to a five-story warehouse and cotton mill compound at around 9 p.m. in the late fall. The majority of the night was uneventful, and I really liked this place, because it was big and open, and you could generally see to the other side of the warehouse, 300 to 400 feet on each floor. However, on the third floor, there was an office building, and in the basement, a very damp, dark, and cramped storage area. We wandered the first floor for about 45 minutes before going to the basement, because there were generally cool signs that we could snag to decorate our rooms. The entire time we were down there, I felt like there was someone behind us peering out from around the corners and through the fences dividing the storage areas. But every time I turned around, we were very much alone. I never heard anything. Just that feeling. I didn't say anything because I didn't want to seem scared for no reason. So we continued without any actual incident and moved to the second and then third floor. The third floor is one I generally steer clear of because of how claustrophobic it made me feel. In the darkness, with only two flashlights to reveal the surroundings. The office spaces were laid out with one long hallway running the short side of the building and multiple long hallways running the length of the building. These long hallways had small square rooms on either side and the white walls were covered in spray paint tags, quotes, and artwork. As my buddy walked into one of these rooms, I once again had this funny feeling and I turned around, shining my light back down the hallway and looking into the short corridor that we had just come from. As I did this I saw a shadow at the right side of the doorway and watched it quickly dart to the left, across the doorway and deeper into the building, away from the stairs. I immediately called out to my friend and told him what I saw. He thought I was messing around and trying to scare him. I told him no because I had a rule that we don't scare others while exploring because someone could get hurt. Convinced that I had actually seen something, we left as quickly as we could and I explained the feeling I had when we were in the basement, which he stated he had felt as well but didn't want to seem scared either. I still do not know what or who that was. It still creeps me out because my flashlight was the only light source there. This floor has no windows and it was a distinct shadow from my flashlight. Though I never saw anything to create the shadow, even though it crossed in front of the light. The second experience was at an abandoned grain plant a few miles outside of town. The building is about 18 stories tall, has a small office space connected to the bottom, and is surrounded by massive 10 story cone shaped buildings, which I think were silos, but we could never really figure out what they were exactly. I was with my girlfriend, and she really wanted to go exploring with me, so we decided to go there that night. When we arrived, the area already felt weird because it was bright and everything had a brownish tint to it. Even though it was midnight, we hadn't pulled out the flashlights yet and there was no moon that night. I just decided that our eyes were adjusted to the darkness and moved on. As we walked the two football field access road to the plant, it became eerily quiet. No wind or movement of any kind. The only sound we heard was the leaves under our feet. Once we got to the overgrown parking lot and loading docks at the base of the building, we stood and stared up at the tower and hesitated. She turned to me and said that she didn't feel right about this. I told her she wasn't alone because I had a feeling of dread about going up. Even though I only had fun and happy experiences here, 
even late at night. We decided to go home and watch movies instead, and we both still believe that if we had gone up there that night, something terrible would have happened. I must insist that I am an adrenaline junkie and normally do not shy away from these experiences, but for some reason that night, I had the urge to turn and run. I don't know if a stare would have given out on the exterior of the tower, ten plus stories off the ground, or if someone or something malicious was waiting up at the top. But I am glad I spent the night watching movies and eating microwave popcorn instead. This happened in 2015 when my husband and I were together. We've since separated, and perhaps this story will help you understand why. He and I married that year, and he always was a little off. Sometimes more off than on. He served in the military, and was proud of his time served. And I was proud of him too. However, he had a tendency toward visual hallucinations. I'm not sure if it's the PTSD or his familial history of mental illness, but he saw things. Usually it happened while driving. Once he saw an eight-foot spider casing the side of a barn while we were riding along the road. He asked me if I saw it. He was panicking. I didn't see it. Let me paint a picture. My mom lives deep, deep in the rural south. Further down her road are old houses people still live in and use outhouses to this day. They collect rainwater to drink, etc. Before you get to my mom's road, there's a well-kept farmhouse, pretty close to the main highway. My sister says she's seen a dozen men walking out in the fields behind that house, dressed immaculately in white suits. I promise everything that what I'm saying is true to the best of my knowledge. My husband and I pulled into the highway one night after dusk and are gaining speed as we pass that house. He's driving and I'm in the passenger side, head back, and the farmhouse is on the right of the car. Suddenly my husband swerves and screams. My eyes open. In a blur, I see a white human-shaped creature running at the car pale white, maybe gray skin, crazed, angry eyes. I don't recall that it was wearing clothing. I just remember the flash of white skin. And those eyes, human eyes, unmistakably human, with all the rage and wild contempt that only a human being could be capable of. It was running right for my door, but we passed it right before it made it to the car. My husband screamed and asked if I had seen it. I don't know why. I can't tell you why, but I told him that I didn't. He described it to me, and I reiterated that I had not seen it. Later on, I confessed that I did actually see it, so I'm not a complete liar. I can't let go of the feeling that it wanted to do harm to one of us. It seemed I had locked eyes with it but it was only a split second, so I wonder what my mind had filled in to make sense of the situation. Much more strange things happened to my husband and me, but I can't talk about those things. I feel safe enough describing this, however. For some reason, he seemed like a beacon for the unusual and the unexplainable. He and I separated due largely to his decreasing mental health so I'm not sure what he's been seeing these days. But I know that we both saw something that night. I'm just not sure what it was. I remember about three or four years ago, me, my stepmom, and my stepsister were pretty bored in the house and decided to take a walk around the trail to our local park. When we got there, it was crowded with people, people playing basketball, 
playing tennis, playing volleyball and soccer. Lots of people were having picnics and family barbecues as well. It was nice seeing all the friendly faces and seeing people having a good time. That made me have good vibes and I was in the mood to start moving around and get to walking. We started making our way to the trail. The trail started right under the shaded part of the park where everyone was barbecuing and playing music. We started walking and after about 10 minutes I realized that we were the only people walking the trail. The trail wasn't that big. If you walked at a normal pace, you would lap around the trail once every 15 to 20 minutes. We lapped around the trail once, and I noticed a guy that was randomly standing on the side of the trail. I couldn't tell if he was looking at us or not, because I have bad eyesight, and I didn't wear glasses at the time. But as we got closer to him, I realized that he was indeed looking at us as we walked by. I didn't think much of it at all. I just assumed that he was checking out my stepmom because a lot of men thought that she was very attractive. About five minutes after that, we were on this part of the trail where it kind of went into the woods out of sight from anyone. Me and my stepmom were talking about something random when we both heard footsteps behind us. We both looked back. It was the man who was looking at us earlier. My stepmom and I looked at each other, but still thought nothing of it. He was about 600 feet behind us, not close enough for us to suspect anything. So about two minutes after that, I looked back again, just to see if he was still there. And he wasn't. What the hell? I slipped up and said. I was really confused. We were too deep in the wooded side of the trail for him to have turned around and walked back so quickly. But I just brushed it off. As we made it out of the wooded part of the trail, we saw the man again. This time, he was walking towards us, smiling. Hey, ladies, he said. He looked at each of us, looking for a response. I shot him a friendly smile. My stepsister wasn't even paying attention because she was on her phone with her earphones in. My stepmom says, Hello, how are you doing? And then he began making small talk with my stepmom, saying things like, It's such a beautiful day today, isn't it? Or, This is just the perfect day. I started to get a little tired of fake smiling and acting like I cared about how much this man loved the day and how it made him feel. I guess he caught on to my annoyance by him, and he says, Well, it was nice talking to you fine young women. Enjoy the rest of your day. We walked off. I glanced behind me and he was watching us walk away. This is when I started getting weird vibes from him. We wanted to walk around the trail at least two more times before we left, so after we walked around the trail for another lap, we saw the man again. This time he walked up to us with his hands on his hips. He says, I know you guys are probably tired of me talking to you, but I forgot to mention that I was barbecuing and wanted to know if you guys wanted to join me. My stepmom, trying to be nice, says, Oh, what did you cook? And he says that he would show us if we just followed him. I started having a funny feeling about this guy. My stepmom wasn't having it though. She asks him where he's barbecuing, and he pointed to another wooded area in the park that was off trail, where a lot of people didn't go because of the simple fact that there was no trail, playgrounds, or anything. Right over there, he says smiling. I decided to set up over there because my method of cooking uses a propane tank, and the park doesn't allow you to use those, so I hide it. He laughed. My stepmom said no thanks and tried to ease her way out of the conversation. As we were walking away, he ran up behind me and grabbed my arm, pulling me toward him. I yanked my arm away from him and loudly asked what the hell was wrong with him. My stepmom turned around, saw what was happening, and sprung into protection mode. 
She grabbed her mace out of her pocket that was attached to her keychain. She told him to watch himself or she'd F him up. He said that he didn't mean any harm by it and then ran away. We made our way out of the park and into the parking lot and made our way home. Fast forward a few weeks later. I was upstairs in my room when I heard my stepmom yell, What the hell? This can't be real. I ran downstairs and saw that she was watching the news. The man from the park's mugshot was on the screen. I stand there looking at the TV in disbelief. No way. He had been arrested for raping and beating a 20-year-old woman. He left her for dead. When I saw that it happened in the same park that we were at, it clicked. He was trying to lure us into his trap. He was going to seriously hurt us if we had believed him. He would have sexually assaulted us and more. It makes chills run down my spine whenever I think about that man. Don't ever, ever let your guard down. There are some seriously sick people in this world. To give you some context, this occurred roughly 14 years ago, when I was 12 years old and living in East Side Australian rainforest. When I say rainforest, our house was on a 40 acre property surrounded by bush. The house itself was owned by a Swiss man named Hans. Occasionally, he would come down with his tractor and slash the long grass surrounding our house so we could access slightly more of the property in the summer. It was extremely handy, because if you know anything about Australia, it's that we have a ton of beasties that can very easily kill you. We lived about a 40 minute drive from the small town centre. This meant that if we needed groceries, medical attention, or to contact our parents, say whilst we were at school, it would be a 40 minute drive before anything could be done. The house sat on the side of a large mountain, roughly three quarters up. So naturally, most of the land we called home was strewn with valleys, nooks and hideaways. We had trails we could walk and they led to a stream and a small waterfall. It was a truly beautiful place, but considerably scary to me and my small siblings. We knew our neighbours on both sides of the property. But because the location of our house was pretty remote, the nearest neighbour was a roughly 10 minute drive away. One was a lovely old lady who used to wave at us when we got off the school bus before we made the trek to our house every day. I think our parents asked her to keep an eye on us. The other was a middle aged man and his family. He was a real jerk who excavated around the bottom border where our properties met and continuously interrupted the stream and waterfall's clear flowing water supply. Lots of strange and creepy shit happens when you're living in the middle of nowhere, but one in particular involved a guy who I certainly don't ever want to meet again. Being pretty removed from people, it was extremely rare that we ever got visitors who we didn't know were coming. When people who we didn't recognize turned up, it was usually because they were lost and needed directions. One day though, a man came roaring down our driveway. I remember running inside to tell my dad someone weird was here, and he immediately walked out to see who was the unwanted guest. A little background about my dad. He is literally the most hardcore person you'll ever meet. He has one leg after having it amputated earlier in his life after having a motorcycle accident while he was running from the police. He was in the Navy and was brought up in a very strict household. 
He had grown up in a very rough part of Sydney West, and he has some pretty shady contacts too. In short, he is someone you really wouldn't want to mess with. I wouldn't be surprised if he'd killed someone in his life prior to settling down and having kids. Anyway, my dad goes outside to see what all the commotion is about, whilst my mum keeps us inside being protective. The man has a large, red-furred dog in the back of his car that looks like a German Shepherd cross. It snarled at my dad, but immediately cowered when this stranger told it to shut up. Our own dog Millie, renowned beast killer, was snarling and going ballistic, whilst being chained up to the house. Hi, my name's Johnny. The way the man spoke was like he was a salesman, a really slick and smooth guy, who on the outside seemed friendly, but with the overtone of wanting something. My dad immediately responded with, So what the hell are you doing here then, John? The man was taken aback, obviously not used to dealing with someone as hostile as my dad. Then they talked for a while, and I could hear my dad talk with a sense of confusion about whatever this man had to say. I did, however, overhear my dad say, What the hell are you thinking? Just call the cops. I found out later that the lovely old lady next to us had died. Apparently John was on the other side of her property and went to visit and found her dead. He also asked my dad if they should move the body to make it easier for police to investigate. This is obviously why my dad was telling the man to call the police immediately. So anyway, later that night the police showed up to take the statement from my dad and John, who was hanging around at our house until the police arrived. I remember my dad pulling an officer aside and explaining that John wanted to move the body before when he first arrived. The police left without any more questions, as it looked like she died from natural causes. John was still at our house, and I found him to be quite an unsettling person. The way he smiled, the dark of his eyes. He was unfamiliar, but acting like he was one of us. I remember it was a school night, and I was trying to watch TV, and he was playing songs on his guitar, with my mum and dad at the table. I was angry, because he was ruining my shows, and I told mum I wanted him to go, and that I thought he was weird. She smiled and told me she felt the same, and told me I should go to bed. The next day, things seemed normal. We went to school, came home. Not seeing the familiar friendly face of the old woman stung a bit on my way as we passed her house. It felt strange, and I hoped that she knew her family loved her before her passing. I was a bit sad on the walk home, until halfway down the driveway, I noticed John's car again, parked out in the front of our house. I walked closer and was greeted by his dog Rusty. He walked outside with my dad and I heard him call Rusty to his car as he was leaving. Apparently he was borrowing tools from my dad. He left and waved goodbye like he was someone I was going to miss. Again that sense of over familiarity made me uncomfortable. I didn't know this man, I didn't like this man and I was hoping he would never come down our driveway again. My dad then pulled me aside and asked me what I thought of John. I labelled him a weirdo and told my dad that I was hoping he would not come back. For the second night in a row, when John returned dad's tools, he was sitting in our house playing guitar and annoying everyone. My mum and dad were visibly unimpressed by the situation. I heard my mum and dad argue about him hanging around until eventually my dad told him that he needed to leave as it was time for us to go to bed. He insisted it was early and tried to make an excuse to stay. I found that very odd. I was polite enough to know when someone didn't want me around, so why didn't this man? Or if he did, why wouldn't he leave after ushering him out? My mum and dad had a big talk in their room and my dad told us all that he didn't like John and that he was going to ask him not to come over anymore, and if we saw him again, to immediately tell him. 
The next day was a Saturday. So, we were going to blow up our big, cheap inflatable pool and go for a swim, as it was getting pretty warm. At around 11am, the sound of a car thundering down the driveway alerts me, and I go outside. I run back inside to tell my dad that John has returned. Just like the first time I ever laid my eyes on John, my dad goes outside and we stay inside with mum, watching and listening through the screen door. John again with his weird, over-familiar smile and dark eyes greeted my dad and is met with, Look me, I don't know who you think you are, but I don't want you coming around here anymore. You scare my kids and my wife, and I don't want you to come back. Do you understand? I didn't hear John's replies from his tone. It sounded like he was confused and tried to reason with my dad. Dad wasn't having it, and told him to go, or he would call the cops. As he was leaving, Dad said, Don't come back, or you'll be sorry. This is where things get truly weird, as my dad lays this subtle threat on the man. His face completely changes to one of rage. He glares at us in the house, sticks up his finger, and speeds out of the driveway, shouting profanities and churning up gravel, spraying it towards our house. My dad came back in, and told us that we wouldn't be seeing John anymore, and that if we did, we were going to call the police. I was relieved. This odd man was making me feel uncomfortable in my own home, and the way he reacted when he left confirmed the feeling I got when I first saw him. I can't remember if it was Sunday or Monday after that day, but John did come back, and he tried to reason with my dad and say sorry for whatever caused us not to like him. Before he even got out of the car, my dad said, If you don't turn around and leave, I am going to smash your face in. He did just that. My dad then called the police to inform them what happened. Apparently they were going to go and talk to John. I didn't hear any more of what happened to that conversation. A few weeks went by with no sightings or happenings with John and we all felt like things were back to normal. This was until our mailbox had been tipped out of the ground and smashed or possibly run over. I remember asking my dad what happened, but he wasn't about to give me any ideas. He later told me he knew it was John after the last way their last conversation ended. The next weekend after the mailbox incident, we went into the town to get groceries and a fast food dinner as a bit of a treat. And when we came home down the driveway, dad immediately stopped my mum from proceeding and said that something was wrong. Next to the carport, where we parked our car, at the back of the house, there was a window that opened to the bathroom. My dad must have spotted the window was missing. As we drove down, he got incredibly more tense until we all noticed the window was missing. I remember being confused in the back seat, not really knowing what was going on, until I saw it. A man dark eyes, overly familiar coming from the window that led to the shower. My dad was exploding with rage. He told my mum to rush down the driveway so that we could mess up this guy. The man proceeded to escape the window and run down the back of our property into thick lantana, which is a really thorny shrub-like plant. My dad, only being on one leg, let Millie loose and she was going ballistic, tied up to the house. She raced down the lantana engulfed hill into the darkness. She came back with nothing. My dad went out with a flashlight and couldn't find anything either. I'm not sure if anyone slept that night. None of our possessions had been stolen, or even moved. We must have caught this man just as he was entering the house. The police came the next day and searched for fingerprints with no avail. My father was furious, and again alerted them to John and his strange behaviour. They told us they would look into it once again. That was the last time we heard from John that year. I had almost completely forgotten about him, and had the summer off to enjoy myself and get ready for high school. 
The school I went to was pretty large, considering where we were, but everyone seemed to know each other pretty well, including the teaching staff. Within the first week of school, we were introduced to all the teachers and teacher's aides. I was caught completely unaware when that overly familiar dark-eyed man from the previous year was reintroduced as a teaching aide, except instead of John, as Greg. I went into a little bit of a spin as I was trying to make sense of it all. I was 100% sure that this man named Greg was the same man who had introduced himself to my family as John. At that moment, so many things rushed into my head. What if he killed the old lady? What if he didn't live nearby? What if he wanted to move the body so he could frame my dad? If he lied about something as critical as his name, what else could he be lying about? What if the police never even made contact with him? I was sitting there for a good ten minutes trying to piece together until the teacher called my name to bring me back to reality. And that's when he noticed me. The look on his face when he saw mine was one I'll never forget. He immediately recognised me. He looked shocked. His eyes were wide and he said nothing. Just staring. I just found out his dirty little secret. I could sense that he was now the one feeling uncomfortable and on edge. Later that day, I rushed home to tell my dad who I found. He was shocked and repeatedly asked if I was sure. He went to school with us the next day and discovered the man had put him for indefinite leave yesterday and may not return. When we learnt of the news, my dad told me to watch out and let him know if John or Greg ever returns. This happened over a decade ago. Somewhere in northern Michigan during the summer. My friend Kathy, who is 18, my boyfriend's half-sister, May of 16, and me of 17, drove down from our hometown to visit friends, and were on our way back home in Kathy's shitty little geo. By shitty, I'm talking this piece of crap had engine problems, overheating problems, ignition problems, and was constantly falling apart. More than once, it had stalled or just stopped working in the middle of the street while we were trying to get somewhere. But Kathy thought we'd be fine since we hadn't had any problems with it to our friend's house. It was a little past midnight, and we were roughly an hour away from home, and there's nobody on the road, with dense wood on every side, no street lights, no moon, and I can barely see past the windshield, because I have a form of albinism, which leaves me legally blind in my left eye and with really awful vision in my right eye. My depth perception is terrible and I can't see more than a few feet ahead of me at most. But usually, I can make out lights and other cars when they pass and sometimes street signs and people when they are close enough. We drove down this narrow hilly road, and on the descent down a hill, the geo makes a strange sound. Kathy starts braking, and when we get to the bottom of the hill, the car doesn't work anymore. Kathy swears and turns on the hazard lights. She and I get out of the vehicle and help pop the hood which causes a bunch of smoke to fly out. After the smoke mostly clears, Kathy tries to figure out what went wrong this time. We stand in the dark for at least 45 minutes, 
before we realised that she couldn't fix the car and that we needed a tow truck. These were the days of MapQuest printouts and brick phones. So we couldn't whip out our smartphones and look up the closest tow truck. I decided to give a call to my boyfriend Caleb in order for him to pick us up and suggest we come with a tow to pick up Geo when it was daylight. May and Kathy agree. So I take out my cruddy Nokia and call my boyfriend only to come to the delightful realization that we have no service. I ask May and Kathy if by some kind of miracle either of them have service. Since they both check and shake their heads, May gets a bit panicky and we hold up our phones trying to get a signal to no avail. It's extremely hot and after failing to get any kind of service we are all feeling a bit spooked and uncomfortable. May begs us to do something because she is far more afraid than Kathy and I. Kathy attempts to calm May down and I wonder if the thick woods and hills are blocking our reception. I tell May and Kathy to wait by the car and walk away from them up the hill we had just come down, holding my phone out. We still have no signal. I walk further and further away until I reach the top of the hill. I can't see the outline of the geo anymore, but I can still hear May at a distance. Even at the top of the hill, I don't get a signal. I know it's got to be the trees in the way, so I get this idea of climbing up a tree and calling from there, just to see if it works. In hindsight, this was not my brightest idea. But me being an idiot, I saunter off into the woods in search of a climbable tree. At this point, I just want to go home. And this is the only thing on my mind. I find a nice one with low branches and lift my body upwards towards the trunk. I climb the branches higher and higher. And about midway up the tree, I feel my pack of cigarettes fall out of my short pocket. I'm kind of annoyed, but figure that I can just look for them when I climb back down. I take my phone and hold it up when I get near the top. And I have service. Relieved, I call Caleb. And he doesn't pick up. So I call again, and again, and again, until he does. He answers in a sleepy but pissed voice. But I'm having none of that, and simply explain our situation. He asks where we are, and I give him the name of the road, and my best guess as to how far along we are on it. He says... He will be on his way and tells me to go back and wait with May and Kathy. Then yells at me for being stupid and climbing a tree in the dark with my bad depth perception. I assure him that I'm fine. He's sceptical but says okay and we hang up. I start climbing down the tree and my hand touches a big glob of sap. So I stop and try to wipe the sticky goop on my shirt. I'm already sweaty and gross so I'm not too happy about the sap. While I'm failing at getting this crud off my hands I hear the strangest sound from somewhere below me. 
I completely freeze, not being able to place what the hell that sound was. But it's moving pretty fast. I stare down into the darkness below me, but can't see shit. I just hear this noise continuing. It comes closer and closer, and then I hear it right below my tree. And then it stops, under my tree. I hold onto the branches as tight as I can, and wait. I hear leaves shuffling and twigs snapping. And after a while that stops, and the weird noise starts again. But heading away from me, deeper into the woods. I wait until I can no longer hear the sound, and then finish climbing down and jump out of the tree. It's completely silent now besides the sounds of the woods. So I grope up on the ground for my cigarettes. I don't find them. So I make my way out to the woods and back towards the road. I jog down the hill, and when I reach the bottom, I notice that Kathy and May are not standing outside the car anymore. And the hazard lights are off. I walk over to the car and May rolls down the window a little bit and whispers in a panicked voice, Elizabeth. I point back over my shoulder towards the hill and started to explain that I called her brother. But Kathy yelled, What are you doing? Get the hell back in the car. I give them a weird look, but May unlocks and opens the door, and I crawl into the back seat with her, slamming the door behind me. Kathy slams the locks, and double checks them while May rolls up the window, and makes sure the rest are rolled up. One of the windows has never closed all the way, but there's less than a finger's space, so it's not too much of a big deal. But May is freaked out about it, and Kathy has lost her call as well. I'm still confused, and ask exactly what the hell is going on. May tells me that a bit after I went up the hill, some weird person came out of the woods and ran really fast up the hill in the direction that I went. They got freaked out, and turned the lights off and got into the car. They thought he'd got me, and I am honestly scared at this point, because if I hadn't have stopped to wipe the sap off my hands, I most likely would have gotten out of the tree at the time that I heard the weird noise. I just knew it was that person. I tell them my story and everybody in the car was scared shitless, but are relieved that Caleb is on his way. We only have to play the waiting game now. We sit on the road for what seems like forever. The dread we were feeling made time seem like it was going slower than normal. Kathy and May are looking out the windows surveying the area and I'm just sitting there hoping Caleb will hurry the hell up and come rescue us. Suddenly I hear May whine, oh my god, and she starts crying. Kathy snaps her head to where May is looking and stifles a gasp. I look where they're facing but see nothing but the dark. Then I hear it, through the small opening in the window. Shoo! May ducks down, as though doing that will make her invisible, and Kathy hides her head behind the steering wheel. I follow their lead, and sort of hunch down in my seat, but the noise comes straight up to the window. I can almost make out the silhouette of a tall, skinny man. And then, 
He presses his face against May's window, and I can finally see him. Nobody screams. You think we would, but it didn't happen. We all just stared at each other. He looks at us for a while, until Kathy switches on her brights, in the hope that it would scare him off. But it did nothing. The dude just walked to the front of the car, and stood in front of the headlights. Maybe he thought he could block us from leaving. I don't know. I couldn't make out his features very well. But the guy had to have been somewhere a bit over six foot, and no older than thirty. He had the face of your average Joe. Nothing special. Nothing really sinister or particularly creepy that you'd notice about him if you ran into this dude in broad daylight. Dark, shaved hair, pale skin, long face. May said he had light-coloured eyes and stubble with eyebrows that made him look like he was always concerned. But there was no way I could make that out, so I had to take her word for it. What was really weird was that it was like 80 degrees, and this dude was wearing corduroys, which is what the sound was. Corduroys make that swishy noise when you walk, and an oversized sweater with abnormally long sleeves. The sleeves went over his hand, and flopped back and forth as he paced around in front of the Geo. I'm not sure how long he was in front of the car for, but it was a while. Then good old Corduroy starts doing something really bizarre. He bends his arms up towards his face, which I can only describe as attempting to look like a praying mantis. Because of the way his sleeves were hanging, and then he begins walking circles around the car, rhythmically, taking two steps forward and one step back, like goddamn Willy Wonka, but on speed. This is when I noticed the swishing sound matched up exactly to the sound I heard when I was back in the trees. He was doing the two steps forward, one step back in the woods, when he was going after me. As though this wasn't weird enough. By now, May was sobbing, and Kathy seemed like she had to vomit. So, I felt like I had to be the brave one. I looked at the slight space in the open window, and when he orbited his way over here, I said, Hey man, can you just stop? You're really freaking us out. Corduroy definitely heard me. So he came to a halt and looked back into the car through the windshield straight at me. I asked him very firmly to leave. And he took an extended pause, smiled, then Willy Wonkered his way out of my line of vision and into the darkness. After a while, Kathy said he disappeared into the woods, and May was like, I can't believe that worked. We awkwardly laughed about the weirdo, and glad he left and whatever, and went back to waiting for Caleb, somewhat reassured, but still paranoid. But after some time, Kathy said, Oh no. He's back. I couldn't see, but apparently he was doing the two steps forward, one step back, parallel to us on the side of the road. Then this time, he had a big tree branch he was holding with his sweater-covered hands. May got scared again, and I held her hand so she would feel better about it, even though 
I was ready to shit myself. It was awful, because I didn't know if he was coming towards us, or if he was moving away, or what the hell he was up to. It was kind of like when you knew you were going to be in a jump scare in a horror movie. Then I heard Corduroy swish back towards the geo and onto my window. He smacks it with the tree branch. May and I panic, and I scoot as close to her as possible. They see the dude back up into the woods, then come running back and slamming the branch back into the window, like he's jousting with no horse. Thankfully, the window didn't break, but it got terrifying hearing the noise as he did this repetitively. Kathy perks up in her seat and starts pointing at the road ahead. I see headlights. She blares the horn and flashes the lights. Lo and behold, it's our saviour, Caleb. He bought his older brother, Alex, and they both get out of his car and head over to us. May's sobs turn into joyous laughter as her brothers approach. Now Caleb and Alex have always been tall guys. Walking around with them was like walking around with high elves. I felt very safe. Caleb was a towering six foot eight and Alex around six foot five. So I thought two dudes taller than the corduroy jester would make him leave. But nope. Caleb walks towards Corduroy, trying to assess the situation. And Alex comes over to the car and taps on the window and tells Kathy to get out. She does, and he walks over to her car, and then he comes back and puts the car in neutral so that he can push it off to the side of the road. May and I slowly get out of the car and May bolts for her brother's car. I help Alex push the car to the side while Caleb distracts the jouster by holding the end of his stick and telling him to piss off. Corduroy yanks the branch away from Caleb and starts backing up by going two steps backwards. One step forwards and then disappears into the darkness down the street. I can't see him, but Caleb can. The dude backs up pretty far and then comes launching at Caleb, who sprints the other way down the road, because that stick could have really hurt him. He bumps past Alex, who's already got out of the geo and who was opening his car door leaving me behind the geo alone. Corduroy apparently changed directions and aimed the stick at me. But I really couldn't tell. I just hear everyone shout, Elizabeth! And this startles me. I jump to the side of the geo, hearing Corduroy smash his stick into the back window with a loud thud. I take the long way around the car and sprint off into the road and feel Caleb grab my arm and tug me over Alex's car. I feel like the wind had been knocked out of me and my legs didn't seem to work. But Caleb manages to shove me into the back seat and scrambles into the passenger side. By now, we are all safely in the car and Corduroy is standing like a mantis in front of the headlights again. He abandoned his stick and stood there with no intentions to move. Alex puts the car into reverse, slams on the gas, making me knock my head against the door, then makes the sloppiest U-turn ever and nearly drives us into the woods, but gets us back onto the road. Everyone was a hundred percent freaked out to the max as Alex tore away. 
far over whatever the speed limit was. May and Kathy swear they saw the corduroy guy chasing us after Alex made the U-turn. But there was no way he could catch up with us. The next day, I went back there with Caleb, Kathy, and the dude from the tow truck place. There was no sign of corduroy anymore. But when we approached the geo, we saw that the space where the window didn't close all the way were my cigarettes. The box was missing, but they were all neatly jammed in a row along the window space. I have no doubt it was the work of the corduroy jouster. To this day, I wonder if he knew I was up the tree and took my cigarettes, or if he thought I dropped them and went further into the woods to look for me, or if he just found them later and decided to stick them through the window, because he was absolutely batshit insane. I also still wonder what the hell his intentions were. I still have so many questions. Kathy got a new car that summer after she told her dad what happened. May wanted to go to the police, but didn't even know what we would tell them. Some weirdo was smacking a stick on our car at night and put cigarettes into the window menacingly. The cops probably wouldn't believe a bunch of young people. They'd most likely assume we were on drugs. I was recently talking to Alex and May about the incident, and Alex urged me to share this. I hope none of you are from northern Michigan. And if you're in the area, be careful along the roads. You never know what could be around you in the trees. I was listening to one of my favorite narrators one time, and one story they told reminded me of a really scary encounter I had when I was 13. My parents divorced when I was in the 8th grade, and after my dad moved out, my mom was very single and ready to mingle, so she often left me home alone. I would usually have someone stay the night on nights I knew my mom wasn't going to be coming home, so I wasn't totally alone. One night my friend and I, who I'll call Jesse for the story, was staying the night and for some reason we had the best internet connection in the garage. So we were in there just messing around on MySpace when we started hearing what sounded like two people talking. Jesse and I stopped talking and we were trying to hear what the people were saying. We got up and stood by the garage door, but we still couldn't make it out, so we went outside and looked through the people of my front door. There were two men standing in my driveway by my garage looking around. I immediately freaked out because they weren't standing on the sidewalk or anything. They were standing by my garage like they lived here. I stood there watching them for a minute before one of them started walking up to the door. I quickly, but very quietly, checked to make sure both locks were locked, and then looked back out of the peephole. The man was leaning over the side railing on my porch trying to look into my mom's bedroom window. I instantly signaled to Jesse to go get knives and be very quiet. I looked back outside and the two men were back by the garage talking. Jesse asked what had happened, and I just told her to make sure the doors were locked while I kept watch. She came back quickly and we switched. She kept watch while I looked for the house phone. This was before it was the norm for young teenagers to have cell phones. All of a sudden she says, they're leaving. My heart sank because something in my gut just told me they weren't. Without even thinking, I asked her, Did you lock the side door in the garage? And she said she didn't. I took off through the kitchen into the garage just as I heard our side gate open. I made it to the door and locked the deadbolt before I could get to the doorknob lock. And as soon as I flipped the lock, the doorknob twisted. I thought I was going to puke. I grabbed the handle and locked it before running back inside and locking the garage door. 
I ran to the back door and at that point just started yelling, lock the windows. My back door had these sheer curtains over them where you were still able to see inside and outside. And before I was able to make it to lock the door, I saw someone walk up the back porch. I jumped behind the couch and watched as he tried to open the back door before the second guy followed. Jessie came walking into the living room and I grabbed her and pulled her down behind the couch with me. We both just sat there in silence, terrified, watching these two guys trying to figure out how to get in. I started to cry, and Jesse was just sitting there shaking. After what seemed like forever, they walked off the back porch and into the backyard. We heard them banging around before we saw them walk back to the porch and out the side gate. I ran to the front and looked through the peephole again and saw them walk across the street and get into a car. I told Jesse they were gone. We both burst into tears and just started hugging each other. We called her aunt and she came and picked us up and took us to her house where we stayed the night there. We never told anyone because we thought we would get in trouble for some reason. But after that, I didn't stay home alone for years and even at 25 I still get scared when it's just my daughter and I home alone while my husband is at work or the rare occasion when he goes out with his friends. We're lucky it didn't end worse than that but I'm still scared from it 12 years later. Sometimes things like that really can mess with you for a long time. When I was 16, I went to a quote-unquote online charter school. There are quotes around the word online because it had an actual building you had to go into in a sketchy strip mall. Somehow this place was actually accredited by the state. I started going there because I was 16 and I thought I knew better than my dad at the time, who wanted me to stay in public school. In order to get home, I would have to get onto a bus. The buses in my city are really cheap, and there are a lot of strange people who get on them. Naturally, I had several instances with people on the public transit, but one sticks out in my mind. One day I was sitting on the bus stop bench when a grown man approached me while also waiting for the bus. He was tall, older, and wore dirty clothes. His teeth were all yellowed, which is the second most distinct thing that sticks out to me now besides his mustache. More than likely he was homeless. The first thing he said to me after sitting just a little too close was, Hi, what's your name? It was weird and a little awkward, but nothing too bad. Despite this, it was setting off creep alarms in the back of my head. So I gave him a nervous smile and a fake name. There was no way I was actually giving this guy my real name. Now, I've always looked a lot younger than I actually am, even though now I'm 18. I still get comments from people who believe I'm a freshman in high school. This is due in part to having a round face and still dealing with acne. This is what makes what happened next extra strange. He got closer and told me, You know, you're very pretty. I wasn't used to compliments at the time. To a certain extent, I'm still not. However, I knew I didn't want them from this guy. I just continued smiling nervously and scooted away from him on the bus stop bench. I remember his breath being pretty rancid and him trying to scoot closer to me still. You got a boyfriend? Was the next thing that he asked. I'm gay, but I did answer to his question. At the time, I actually was trying to force myself to date a close friend who was a man and liked me, so it wasn't a total lie. Even if I wasn't, though, I still would have said yes. This did not deter him. He tried to touch my hair more than once, rested his hand on my knee, and tried to move it to my thigh and some other weird stuff. The next thing he pressed me for was my number. I didn't actually believe this guy had a phone, but in case he managed to find a payphone in the year 2017, I decided to give him a fake number just in case. I was dreading getting on the bus, where I'd have to ride all the way home to an empty apartment for hours with a window that had a broken lock. Even if he didn't plan on doing anything that day, what if he did another time? I didn't want this man knowing where I lived. When the bus finally got there, after what felt like forever, I was terrified but unsurprised to find that he got on the same bus. I made a beeline for a seat next to an older woman where he couldn't sit next to me. 
He sat in a close by seat and kept glancing at me for what felt like forever until I had an idea. The next stop was right by a convenience store where a friend of mine named James worked. I didn't know if he'd be working at the time, but it honestly was my only hope, and if that didn't work, I could at least go inside and call the cops and my mom. When the bus stopped, I got off of it and ran to the store as fast as I could. Sure enough, James was working. I checked to see if the guy had followed me to discover that he had and was walking towards the store. I quickly explained to James the fact that I had been followed by a creepy older man and didn't know what to do. Now, he wasn't a bodybuilder or anything, but James was a big guy, not the kind of guy you'd want to mess with. He told me he would take care of it. When the creep entered, James approached him and asked him if he needed anything. The old guy glanced at me and said he didn't need anything but was going to wait outside if that was okay. James told him no, it wasn't, and that if he did, he'd be calling the police. The creep did not appear to like the sound of that and seeing as how he had no chance of ever beating James in a physical confrontation, he left in a hurry. After I was sure that he was gone, I completely broke down and cried for a good long time in that store. James may have saved my life that day, or at least saved me from something horrific. I ended up calling my mom to come get me. She was upset about having to leave work, but when I told her the whole thing, that was basically the end of my online school and bus days. I finished my semester and got rides for my grandfather, and went back to public school the semester after that. So this happened when my friend and I were 15 years old. We both lived super close to each other, so I would often go to her place after school to do homework and hang out. A little info, her house has the park. Her house has a park that pretty much backs up to it, and a side entrance to the park is literally right next to her house. It's typically only used by people in the neighborhood, but you are immediately in the thickest part of the woods when you enter from that entrance. So it was a Friday, and we really didn't have any homework for the weekend. Her mom had dropped us off at the house, and left to do errands. So we decided to go on a walk with her dog. We live in a very good neighborhood with low crime, and we were very familiar and comfortable with this park. Plus, there being two of us with the dog during the day, we weren't at all worried. So we change out of our school uniforms, get some hiking shoes on, and make our way to the park entrance. We start our walk and the day is perfect for being outside. We instantly fall into comfortable conversation as we head to our favorite part of the woods. So there's a couple miles of winding paved trail until we run into the first split. If you go left, it will lead you to the main park area with swings, restrooms, picnic areas. If you go to the right, it leads you to a bridge that will take you to another trail option. We went right to head over the bridge since the trail we wanted was that direction. This is where things got weird. We began making our way over the bridge and we see a runner headed our direction. We both moved to the side to let him pass and I just got a really bad feeling. You know the one where your hair stands up on its ends, your heart speeds up and just a true sense of alarm goes off about this person. He passed us and stared back at us over his shoulder for a while, but I mostly decided I was being over paranoid, or he was staring at the dog because who doesn't like looking at a cute dog? After all, he seemed pretty average and non-threatening in general. Still, I tucked it in the back of my mind, just to stay a little bit more aware of our surrounding. So we continue on our walk, which leads to another two trail option. Left continues as a paved area and right is a dirt trail that is overgrown in spots. We took the right because it was deeper into the woods and where our hangout spot was. So our spot is completely off the dirt trail and we have to walk across a log over a small part of the creek to get to it. So not many people know about this area, which is why we liked it. Most people don't even take the dirt trail unless they're bird watching 
or taking nature photos. We get to our spot and we hang out and just talk about life. We both didn't have the best home life. We both had crazy moms, to put it mildly. So it was nice to be able to chat with each other about stuff in privacy. So maybe 10 minutes after we made it to this spot, we heard a branch snap at a distance from us. From where we were, we could see that someone was on the dirt trail, but whoever wouldn't have an easy view of us. We look over and my heart just drops. I can just make out the runner from the bridge, through the trees. He had on bright red shorts, so it was easy to tell it was him. Immediately, we both knew that something wasn't right. This isn't a trail someone out on a run would take ever, and he obviously turned around on his run to head back in our direction. And he had originally come from the paved trail that we didn't take earlier, so alarm bells were ringing. He walks past our spot and quietly continues down the dirt trail, no longer running, like he's trying to be quiet. We are at a decent distance, and thankfully, he was keeping his gaze forward, or he might have seen us. My friend and I are silently watching, and when he is out of view, she turns to me and says, We need to go, now. And I said, Yeah, something is not right about this guy. My friend just nods yes. So she lets her dog off the leash. She's very good at following, and she would be able to move faster without the lead, and so would we. I do have to mention that this dog will not be helpful if the situation escalates because she failed at being a service dog because she was overly friendly to strangers. So very obedient, but everyone is a friend. So no help coming from her. And he hadn't even been deterred from seeing her to begin with. She was just a small yellow lab. We take off at this point, trying to be quiet and fast because we'll have to cross over that dirt trail that he was on and we don't want him coming back and seeing us. My friend falls, scrambling across the log into the creek. I slip at the end so both of us have very waterlogged shoes, and we panicked because of the noise. So we just take off knowing that we had already made a ton of noise anyways. We didn't run back to the paved area, because we were too deep into the woods at this point, and a straight shot was our best bet. We very quickly hear noise from behind us, and she yells to me, He's following us! I'm not a runner, but adrenaline saved the day, because I could have ran a marathon with how scared I was. So we are crashing through bushes, and not following any sort of trail at this point, but heading in the direction we needed to go, to get out of the woods and closer to her house. We had to be running for at least 15 minutes, and most of the time my friend is yelling directions to me from behind, because she can see the guy. I'm clumsy, and I knew if I were to look back that I would be the idiot to trip like in the movies. At some point we either just lost him, or he gave up. But we finally broke through the woods into the field between the woods and the houses in her neighborhood. So we jog close to the fences, heading to her house, scanning the edge of the woods, and trying to get oxygen back into our lungs. We never saw anything once we made it out of the woods but we didn't feel safe until we got inside her house. We were a mess. She soaked up to her thighs and I'm soaked up to my calves. At one point I wrapped my hands around the branches coated with thorns, so my hands are bleeding. She has some rips in her pants and shirt and her dog was perfectly fine because she didn't fall into the creek like an idiot and avoided all the thorns. We immediately start talking and she said she had the same creepy feeling about the guy too, but didn't say anything at the time either. She said she noticed that he had given her dog kind of a dirty look, which is what made her feel uncomfortable. She had also caught a few glimpses of his face while we were running from him, and she said he looked absolutely livid. Her mom got home and we told her what happened. Now her mom is not someone I'm a fan of. She merely tells us he was probably an off-duty cop, coming to check on us to make sure we were okay since we were two young girls alone in the woods. Neither of us bought her explanation, but she managed to make us feel like idiots. I never mentioned anything to my mom, because she would have just blamed us for going on a walk by ourselves, so nothing came of it. That was also the last time we went into those woods, just the two of us. We only ever went into the woods with a big group of friends, or her older brother, but we never saw him again. 
As an adult, I realized how truly messed up the situation was. The guy had to have been about 6'2 in his 40s. I was 5'1 and my friend was 5'3. We both looked even younger than 15 because I still had people at restaurants automatically giving me a child's menu when we went down to eat. So there wasn't any real excuse for a grown man following two young females in a secluded part of the woods when we were obviously scared of him. It's been over a decade now and we now live in the same neighborhood and frequent the park. The dirt trail is now paved and a lot of trees have been cleared away. I still to this day can't go to the park without looking for that guy or keeping a constant look around to see if somebody's following me. So I truly hope I never ever have to meet this creep again. I had a best friend in high school named Lena. We were friends for about a year and a half, and we would spend almost every weekend at her house listening to music, watching scary movies, and gossiping. She was just a little bit crazy, the type of girl to beat up her boyfriend's exes unprovoked. She actually did that once, and she would catfish people. I say we were best friends, but actually it was more like I looked up to her and she liked that she could boss me around and hang out with me whenever she pleased. She was extremely manipulative and two-faced. She had a hobby of being nice to girls at school and then going on their social medias and making fun of everything they posted. She would befriend people just to get information from them. When we were younger, Lena was dating this guy named Nolan. They dated for about a year and a half and had lots of troubles the last six months or so. He would go out drinking most weekends and she would cry in the middle of the night and blow up his phone, yelling at him and making him feel guilty. She was borderline psychotic when it came to his exes or the girls that he was friends with, and they just weren't really working out, but they stayed together anyway. At some point, Nolan got Lena pregnant, and one of Lena's other friends, who was named Autumn, became pregnant at the same time from the guy I was in love with. Naturally, I wanted nothing to do with Autumn, but because they were pregnant together, Lena started hanging out with Autumn most weekends and neglected our friendship. After about a month, I became fed up with it and started ghosting her. At first, she tried to apologize, but I was not having it since the other girl was dating the guy I had been in love with for two years, and I was jealous and childish. So eventually, Lena got pissed at me and stopped trying. A few months went by and Lena had the baby. Nolan and Lena stayed together to take care of their son, but their relationship was obviously horrendous at that point. Lena had cheated on him, and Nolan decided he wanted out of the relationship, but continued to see his son and buy things for him. However, Lena and Lena's mother made things very difficult for him by constantly changing the days he could see his son and refusing to let him take his son anywhere besides Lena's house. Lena's mom would also throw out Christmas presents from Nolan, ignore his phone calls, and eventually told him that he wasn't allowed at the house. Nolan begged for months to see his son, but it was clear that Lena and her mother didn't want him in the picture. Nolan offered to pay child support, but they didn't want that either. They just wanted him gone, so he stopped trying, and apparently even that wasn't what they wanted. Lena took to social media to talk about how Nolan was a deadbeat. She told everyone that she knew that being a single mother was really hard, and the baby daddy refused to take care of his kid. A year after they broke up, I met Nolan in person. We had been talking online for a couple of months about Lena. We had shared stories about her crazy meltdowns and her manipulative tendencies. And we talked about the time that he came to her house when I was there and attempted to scare her by jumping out when she was out the front door, but instead accidentally jumped out at me. He thought it was the funniest thing ever, that my face stayed stone cold and I just said, sup. We had similar sense of humors, and at the time I had no one. I had just come out of one of the worst depression episodes of my life. It had lasted for a good year, and I had dropped out of school, been doing drugs, isolated myself for weeks at the time and considered suicide. He was the one to try and help me back from the brink. He was kind and he was my support system. We were just friends at first. When Lena caught wind of our friendship, she reached out to me. At this point, we hadn't been friends for a year and a half. 
We caught up and talked about what had been going on in our lives. She asked what was going on with Nolan, and I told her we were just friends. Everything seemed fine. That's when her erratic behavior started. She would randomly block me on social media, and then unblock me a month or two later. Sometimes we would talk, like, how are you? Everything good? And then the next day, I'm blocked. At one point, I asked one of her friends to get her to tell me why she was doing it, because I was confused. So she unblocked me and told me she was salty about the situation with Nolan, and the fact that I was friendly with him. I asked her why she kept making up with me, and then suddenly getting pissed again and cutting me off. I told her I was tired of thinking things were good, only for her to turn around and pretend like we had never said anything to each other. That's when she said she could block me again or keep me unblocked, whatever I wanted was fine, but she felt I had done her wrong by abandoning her during her pregnancy and befriending her ex-boyfriend. So then I tried to explain to her why Nolan was my friend. I tried to tell her that Nolan was all I had in the darkest time of my life. I tried to tell her why her neglecting me for Autumn hurt my feelings, but she wasn't having any of it. I understand where she was coming from, I do, and I acknowledge the fact that I acted childish and in a cruel way, but I had tried to make up with her multiple times. I tried really hard and she couldn't even stick with whether she could forgive me or not. So I told her to block me again and be done with it. She told me she wasn't going to block me again, and then she gave me her blessing with Nolan. She said it was fine if we wanted to date, and she said she hoped I had a really good life, and I said the same to her, and I really meant it. We had a bad end, but I was glad we could at least wish each other that. It was a few months after I last spoke to her that Nolan and I started dating. I had waited so long because I was worried about Lena, even though we weren't friends anymore, but she had given me her blessing, and she was dating somebody new, so I went with it. It was around this time that I received a friend request from a girl on Facebook named Casey. Casey said she lived in a big city in my state and said we had mutual friends and I had once gone to her school in that city. I assumed we had gone to school together and I just didn't remember her. She seemed like a real person. She claimed to work at Hooters. She made posts about how her work days went, had several pictures of the same girl, and made frequent posts about her ex-boyfriend. I accepted the friend request, and she messaged me telling me how pretty she thought I was. I thanked her and told her to message me anytime she wanted to chat. For the next few months, I was clueless. I went about my regular life, posting about the things me and Nolan did. Getting my GED, hanging out with friends, visiting my mom. Occasionally, I would see strange posts on my timeline from Casey but didn't think much about it because I had over a thousand friends from Facebook and I rarely saw them. They were mostly posts about how she hated her baby daddy and how her line of work sucked, but there were two posts in particular that caught my eye. One was a post that seemed to be referencing something I had posted the day before, and the other was of her saying, we all know of that tramp named with my first name in the blank. So I went to her profile and then clicked through months and months of posts. Some were about her line of work. Everything else was related to me and Nolan. Everything. There were posts of her complaining about her deadbeat baby daddy, buying things for everyone but his kid. Posts about how sad she felt about the breakup. Posts about how she missed me and thought of me as a sister, which is crap and I'll explain why later. Posts about how I stole her boyfriend. She made fun of my hobbies, had directly referenced some of my posts, talked about how she hated me, said I was a dirty girl, and in her later posts, even went so far as to put my initials, or full first name, in the post. She even had people in the comments egging her on, and talking crap too, even though no one knew who she was talking about, but I did. She mentioned things only the two of us knew. She referenced our past experiences. It was undoubtedly Lena. I messaged Casey and told her I knew it was Lena. She played dumb and told me the initials were of another girl that she knew. When I looked up the name she gave me, not a single person on Facebook had that name. When I told her that, she brushed it over and tried to get me to talk about Lena. So I played along and talked hardcore crap about Lena. I lied about a lot of things in an attempt to get her to out herself. 
but in the end all she did was send a screenshot of our conversation to Lena's account in an attempt to make it look like Casey was real and was trying to help Lena out by showing her what kind of person I was. Casey then immediately deleted her account. She didn't block me, she deleted it. I had my dad and I had a friend check and neither of them could find Casey's profile. So then another month went by and I found out she had reactivated the account. And because I can't block a deleted account, she was in my friends list again and had access to my profile for who knows how many days. So I blocked her. She then sent me friend and follow requests on three other websites under the Casey name, which I also blocked. It was around that time that me and Nolan began to get a lot of friend requests from obviously fake accounts. We would report them and block them and try to pretend she wasn't going insane. One of these fake accounts was extremely obvious because it had poked both me and Nolan on the same day at the same time. She was taunting us, I guess. I blocked that account too. Please be aware that at this time, Lena had married her boyfriend. She was doing this while married to somebody else. A year later, I thought it had stopped. And one day I went to the Casey account on my friend's Facebook because I wanted to see if she was still posting about me. And when I scrolled down, I realized I had missed a post last time. This post was Lena mocking the fact that my mother, yes, my birth mother, called her frequently to talk crap about me and give her information on me and Nolan. Called her frequently to talk crap about me and give her information on me and Nolan. Turns out my mother and Lena went to the same college, and my mother thought what better way to make friends than by helping someone stalk my daughter. She would ask me about mine and Nolan's relationship often. She talked crap about Lena and would act like the perfect mother to my face. She didn't raise me, so I didn't trust her 100%. For that reason, I never gave her my phone number, address, or any other information that I felt was private. When my dog went missing, she tried to convince me to post my address on Facebook. She kept saying how important it was that people know exactly where he went missing from. What a load of crap. Thank God I didn't because I might have woken up to Lena punching my head in, or worse. For a while there, I was legitimately paranoid. Every time I went to the store or went outside, I was watching my surroundings closely, because if Lena was willing to beat the crap out of a girl Nolan had dated for three weeks, unprovoked, what would she do to me if she saw me in public? Would she kill me? I had never met somebody so obsessive. Let me just say Lena was horrible as a friend. She was manipulative, bossy, judgmental, rude, erratic, narcissistic, and two-faced. When I felt my first heartbreak, she spent all night talking crap about the guy, saying I deserved better. Eventually, I talked crap with her to make myself feel better. And what does she do? She messages him on Facebook and tells him everything that I said. She guilt-tripped me about having other friends. She convinced me to abandon one of my friends just because she didn't approve of her. She would ignore me when there were other people around. If I complained about anyone, she would go tell that person what I said, even if she had said something worse about them. She would go through people's Facebooks and laugh at them and talk about how dorky they were, and not in a nice way. In a this person is scum for being a bit dorky kind of way. She would make me feel ridiculous for liking the things I did and I never felt like I could be myself around her. It amazes me how many people Lena has manipulated. Even her poor husband probably doesn't know she was a stalker. So yeah, there you have it. Lena cyber-stalked me for two years. And if I had given my mom my address, it might have become actual stalking. She hasn't been trying to stalk me for a while now. I cut my mom off and deleted all but 40 people off of my Facebook. I made all my social media accounts private to keep this from happening again. I'm hoping I won't ever hear from Lena again. The last obvious sign I've gotten of her still trying to stalk me is a fake account that sent me a friend request about three months ago. An account that was a few months old had the same last name as my friend, who told me he didn't know her and only liked two Facebook pages, one of which was a grocery store page and the other was mine. My obscure Facebook page 
my page that has spaces in between the letters in Japanese letters in my name. My page that you have to either know the exact name of or have a link to find. My page that I already had to ban Lena and Casey from because both accounts also liked it. Sometimes I wonder if Lena is even trying to be secretive or if she's just stupid. At least her attempts are few and far between now, so I don't consider her to be stalking me anymore. Sorry for such a long story. I was young when all of this stuff happened, and I made some really dumb choices. So go easy on me. I know I'm not 100% faultless in this, and yes, me and Nolan are still together, and we'll be celebrating our four-year anniversary in a couple months. I might be called as a witness for a murder. I realize this sounds dramatic, but unfortunately I'm not exaggerating at all. Before I start this, I want to say that I've been assured that it's not a problem for me to talk about what I witnessed. And the police told me they probably won't even find the man in question. Just a little information about me and this story. I'm a 23-year-old female college student, but at the time I was 22. This story took place about five or six months ago. Let me start the story off by explaining a few things. I have an issue where I dislocate my knee very frequently. It's so severe that they said I'll probably need all of my ligaments replaced in the next few months. So during this time, I had yet again dislocated my knee. The night before this took place, I had been in the hospital because I couldn't get my knee back in as I usually could. So I was in a full leg immobilizer and on crutches at the time. And I couldn't go to the pharmacy for my pain meds until the next evening because I'm a college student and clearly school takes priority over health. I was going to Walgreens because it was close to my campus and it was around 6 p.m. This particular Walgreens was on a very busy main street in the city I lived in. I have anxiety, so I'm extremely aware of my surroundings at all times. So I was pulling into the parking lot when I noticed a very distinct looking car, and I noticed a man and a woman at the car. The woman was loading groceries into the back of their car, and the man was sitting in the passenger seat with the door open. I could tell there was something really wrong. Though I couldn't quite tell what was happening, his body language just made it clear that it was about to be a bad situation. I started driving really slowly because I wanted to make sure everything was okay, which, unfortunately, it was not. I couldn't hear what was being said at the beginning because I had my windows rolled up. However, I watched this man get out of his car and use the entire force of his body to slam the door shut as hard as he could. He was clearly very mad. He walked around the back of the car toward the woman he was with and was getting in her face and yelling at her. He pushed her kind of hard, but at that point he was still standing. However, he quickly just snapped. He punched this woman directly in the face. I was so shocked to be witnessing this because as I mentioned, it was a very busy area and I was very clearly there in my SUV. The woman was somehow still standing, though she had stumbled a little completely understandable because he punched her very hard. Unfortunately, the guy was just getting started. He punched her in the face two more times by that point. She was having trouble standing. He grabbed her by the hair and slammed her face into the side of the car multiple times and then threw her on the parking lot. He began to kick her repeatedly and there was blood everywhere. He picked her up by her hair and slammed her head into the car again. I would like to mention that I had rolled down my window soon after the attack began because I needed to know what he was saying. He was yelling things like, I'm going to murder you and you're going to regret this and some other stuff that revolved around him blaming her for him trying to murder her in a parking lot. The time this attack spanned over was really not that long in reality. Though it felt like hours in the moment, it was all over in a little over a minute. By the end of it, I had finally got to that spot to park in where I could run inside. I was so panicked that I attempted to run inside without my crutches on a freshly dislocated knee while in a leg immobilizer. 
I got inside and I yelled that there was a man beating up a woman in the parking lot. Some of the men waiting in line ran out to try to save her, but while I had been trying my best to run inside, the man had forced the woman into the car and was forcing her to drive away. Everyone who saw that woman were horribly disturbed because her face did not look human. There was blood all over the parking lot and her entire body, but her skull was not in the same shape it was before the attack began. I called the police, and when I talked to some police officers, they told me I would most likely be called to be a witness for a murder if they found her body. After talking to me and the man who had seen what she looked like, they were blunt with me and told me the woman was probably not going to live unless there was some sort of miracle and someone got her to the hospital. I've been feeling guilty about this since it happened honestly. I feel like there's something more I should have done at the time. Many ideas ran through my head. At first I was going to jump out of my car and try to stop him, but I saw what he was doing to her and I knew I wouldn't be any help to her if I was beaten to death as well. I also considered slamming my car into him, but again I was worried for her safety. I didn't want to accidentally hit her. I know I did what I could, but I still feel guilty because I feel like it's my fault that she probably died, even though I was just someone who witnessed it. And I did what I could, especially given the state of my leg. This entire incident truly haunts and guilts me to my core. I do want to mention one thing. I genuinely believe this guy was on some sort of hardcore drugs. I believe this for a few reasons. I don't mean to be morbid, but if someone is going to try to kill somebody by beating them to death, typically they wait until they're alone and are not in a store parking lot on a major street where many people have the potential to see them. Also, the guy wasn't really that big muscle-wise, but he was hitting so hard that it seemed like he had taken something. He seemed completely unaware of reality and his surroundings. He didn't even seem to register that I was driving by very slowly, staring at him. There were a few other things that I can't remember at this moment, but when I told my roommates and my boyfriend what happened, everyone agreed that he was most likely on drugs, especially because the city our school is in has a huge drug problem. So I hope I never meet that vicious monster I watched beat a woman to death again, but if we do meet, I hope it will be when you're put behind bars for what you did to that poor woman. When people say nothing good ever happens past midnight, they say it for a reason. I, along with my girlfriend at the time, and my best friend snuck out during the summer. We did this quite often, and each time was better than the last. I mean the first time the three of us did set the bar really low, and it was easy to be beaten. It was about 1.30 a.m. and the three of us were downtown. We have weddings in our town, and as you know, these things go really late. We saw a couple stumbling on the street, dressed for a wedding that was happening that night. We started cracking jokes to each other, like the dumb teenagers we are. And then out of the blue, I see the man hit his wife. I'm not sure if they're a boyfriend, girlfriend, or husband and wife, but for the story's sake of the simplicity, I will go with the latter. I look over to my girlfriend and my friend and see the look of shock on their faces. The man started screaming at her, saw us, and took off. Instantly, and against my girlfriend's wish, I ran up to the wife that was crying face down on the ground. My girlfriend and friend were at the end of the street. I told them to give us some space. I'm trained to deal with things like this. I'm in a Navy program and know how to talk to people. She was clearly very, very intoxicated and could hardly talk. I was able to calm her down and ask her what her name was, where she was from, where she's staying, etc. This conversation went on for about 15 minutes, and by now, my group had caught up with me, and like I asked, was giving me space to do my thing. She told me where she was staying, but told me she didn't know how to get there, and that she was from out of town. I told her not to worry and that everything would be okay. I helped her up and started to walk to where she was staying. It was about a quarter mile away, and when someone has a very difficult time walking, it takes a long time just to go 20 feet. Nonetheless, I knew that this was the right thing to do, and I wanted to help. Coincidentally, the police station was right across the street, and thank God for this. I usually check my back when we go out at night, because there are some pretty weird people where I live, and I was lucky that I was being that cautious. 
I turned around to see a man, tall in stature, incredibly muscular, and angry behind us and my friends. I turned to the woman and asked if that was her husband, to which she started trembling and was able to mutter, yes. I told my friends to get away from us because I knew things were going to get bad. They went to the other side of the street and I could tell that they were scared for me. My friend had his phone out ready to call 911 and my girlfriend was shaken. Then this guy was on me and his wife. He was screaming at me for having the audacity to help her and for being near his wife. The entire time I was occasionally glancing down at his hands when they weren't in my face to make sure that they weren't in fists. I never said anything to try to start more of an argument, only things like, sir you need to please step away from me, and you need to calm down, the police station is just literally across the street, things that you would say to avoid getting the crap beat out of you. I'm a tall guy, I'm 6'2", and feel like I'm not someone who people want to mess with, but I'm under 18. This guy was probably early 30s, about 6'4", and 100% muscle, very very scary man. I looked down, saw his hands in a fist and stepped back quickly, keeping his wife behind me. This wasn't smart. Standing between a drunken man and his wife is a big, big no-no. I mouthed to my friend, get the police right now. He turned around and sped off the other way. The man didn't notice me doing this, so I figured I was good. The police answered my friend, and he was pointing over to us, but they didn't come out. It took them about five minutes to come, and by then the guy fled. I told them what happened, and they sent out a search team for this guy. Turns out he was hiding on the road we were just on a little down the way. The police took the woman and escorted her back to where she was staying, and kept the man in the station for the night. They thanked me for what I did, and told my friends and me that we should go home. We agreed, as youth does, and went on our way. So the moral of the story is, if you see someone who needs help, help them. It's up to you. Be the hero they need. And to the guy that almost started a fight and probably would have killed me before he stopped, let's never meet again, you piece of crap.